My name is Peter Tribowitz. I head up the International Relations Department and direct the U.S. Center uh, here at the LSE. Uh, tonight's lecture is sponsored by the International Relations Department, and it's our great pleasure uh, to host Dame Manoush uh, Shafiq, the director of the LSE, and Professor Michael Mastanduno, the inaugural Susan Strange, Professor of International Relations. We're here basically to do two things uh, this evening. First, to discuss the future of U.S.-China relations at what is increasingly looking to many as a kind of hinge moment in world politics. And second, to recognize the lasting contributions um, that Professor Susan Strange made to the study of international political economy and to the LSE, and to help us celebrate Susan Susan's many achievements. We're fortunate to have two of her children with us tonight, Jane Straitfield and Giles Merritt. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have um, Director Shafiq, who's graciously offered to make some um, opening comments about Susan's contributions um, and who will be joining us in the conversation uh, after um, the lecture. But before inviting uh, Director Shafiq to the, um, to the podium, just a few housekeeping notes, um, just so you kind of understand what the plan is, because there's going to be kind of a lot of, I get up, I sit down, I get up, I sit down. Um, <laughs> first, after um, Manoush's um, opening remarks, I'm going to return and uh, introduce um, uh, Mike Mastanduno. And after Mike's lecture, Manoush and I will put a couple questions to, um, to Mike before uh, we open it up for um, uh, question, questions from the floor. And I'll do my, we've got uh, a great team of ushers here and I'll do my level best to get as many questions in as possible before we hit the bewitching hour of uh, 8 p.m. Um, the title of tonight's lecture you see up there for those of you uh, who want to reach out to, um, to Donald Trump tonight, the suggested Twitter hashtag is uh, um, hashtag LSE Mastanduno, and, and just tell him that Mike sent you. Um, so, and um, before uh, I forget, could you um, please turn your uh, phones to silent um, if you haven't? The event is being uh, recorded. It'll be made available on a podcast and it's also being live tweeted by uh, the U.S. Center. Um, so, okay, with that, please join me in welcoming um, Director Manu Shafiq to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here this evening to mark the inauguration of the Susan Strange Professorship of International Relations and tonight's inaugural lecture by Professor Michael Mastanduno. It's terrific to see so many students, alumni, and Susan's children here, uh, and especially gratifying for me. Uh, I was here as a student at the school doing my MSc in the 1980s, and at that time, Susan Strange was holding forth on the state of the world economy and what it looked like. And I'm particularly helpful, uh, ha happy as the school's director to announce the LSE's first professorship named after a world leading female academic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the school couldn't have made a better choice, and uh, I'm particularly grateful to the International Relations Department for showing the way. Uh, I'm going to keep my comments brief here, because we're mainly here to listen to the main act, Mike Mastaduno, um, who's going to talk to us about the US and China in the age of Trump. But for those of you who don't know about Susan's many accomplishments, uh, I just wanted to say a few words of background. She was arguably Britain's most influential scholar of world politics in the latter half of the 20th century. She's widely recognizing, recognized for putting the field of international political economy on the map, and the program that she launched, the IPE program, uh, continues to thrive here at the school, and many of the students in that program are here in the hall tonight. We really shouldn't have expected less from Susan Strange. She was, of course, an LSE graduate with a first-class honors degree in economics from 1943, an unusual time for a woman to be studying economics. 
And it's worth remembering that academia was not her first port of call. She started her career as a financial journalist at The Economist and then The Observer. And that's where she honed her writing skills and her, her fondness for intellectual give and take. Some would have called it a take no prisoners approach to debating. But she returned to the school in the 1960s and uh, quickly established herself as a leading voice uh, in the vital scholarly debates at the time on the world economy, on financial issues, on state sovereignty, and the role of American power. Her work was widely read on both sides of the Atlantic. Her books are still widely referred to and assigned. And the school very quickly made her the Montague Burton Professor of International Relations in 1978. Again, she was the first woman to hold that professorship. It was only a matter of time before the International Studies Association elected her as their president. And, and, and she was, of course, a leader in her field. But probably her greatest academic achievement uh, was in her students, particularly her PhD students. And many of them are scattered around the globe. I still meet people who tell me I was taught by Susan Strange at the, at the LSE. And many of them, they are just scattered over leading institutions around the world. And they still say, she shaped my world view. The International Relations Department, of course, has had a very distinguished history at the school and have had many distinguished scholars working in its faculty. But it's hard to think of another member of the International Relations Department in the past 50 years who's had a more lasting impact on the discipline. And so therefore, it's very fitting that a chair be, be in her name and that we recognize her tonight. And also that it's an opportunity to invite a world leading scholar like Mike Mastundo to speak to us this evening. So I will turn over back to Peter, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you, Manoush, for um, those reflections on, on Susan's career and her impact at the school um, and beyond. I think one of the other things to mention about um, Susan is that she was a keen observer of the United States and its place in the international system. She was writing back in the late 1980s, she, many thought the United States was, was in decline and she pushed back hard arguing that the United States had huge, as she put it, structural advantages that other scholars and analysts were missing. Structural advantages in the provision of security, in financing and credit, in the production of goods, and in the acquisition, communication, and storage of knowledge and information. She was right, and the declinists of the era were proved wrong. But we're in a new era, the age of Trump and a time of Xi. One wonders what Susan would say now at a time when China is rising and America is retrenching, would she make the same judgment? But well, we don't have Susan here tonight, but fortunately we do have someone who's written brilliantly about these issues, Professor Mike Mastanduno. Mike is the Nelson A. Rockefeller Professor of Government and the former Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Dartmouth College. He's the author of, or editor of uh, eight books and dozens of uh, journal articles uh, on international politics. He's a leading expert on the politics of the world economy and especially the political economy of East Asia. He's lectured widely in Asia and in Europe. He's held visiting and teaching research appointments at the University of Tokyo, the Graduate School of Economics and International Relations at Milan, and the East-West Center in Honolulu. He's received numerous prestigious awards and grants, including fellowships from the Fulbright Foundation, the Brookings Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Social Science Research Council, among others. And beyond the academy, Mike hosts a popular bi-weekly current affairs radio show in the United States. And he's a longtime contributor to the US State Department's National Intelligence Council Global Trends Surveys. I think it's especially appropriate to have Mike uh, with us tonight not only did he know Susan, 
she took pity on him when he was a young PhD student from <laughs> Princeton trying to get his bearings in London. But Mike was also the prize student of that other great IPE scholar of the last quarter of the 20th century, Robert Gilpin. Well, Susan and Bob disagreed on many important issues, including the question of American power and decline. They shared many intellectual sensibilities and commitments. They both worked against a very large theoretical canvas. They both held a firm grasp of history and they both tackled big and enduring questions of world politics. Tonight's speaker shares those same sensibilities and commitments, and it's a very great pleasure to welcome Mike Mastenduno to the podium. Uh, so where is the keyboard? Ah, uh, that's, we hide it. Um, there we go. There we go. Perfect, just like at Dartmouth. We don't have keyboards. It's all virtual. <laughs> thank you, Peter, and thank you, Director Shafiq, for a kind introduction. And I have to say, it is an honor to be associated with the London School of Economics, and a special honor to hold a chair named for someone who is genuinely, Peter was not kidding, one of my intellectual heroes. Uh, Susan Strange. Um, Director Shafiq has already talked about Susan's contribution in essentially recreating the field of international political economy with a small handful of other scholars after uh, the Second World War. I want to say just one other thing, which is that at a time when more and more political scientists are asking smaller and smaller questions and answering them with more and more technically precise means, it's really great to celebrate a big thinker. And Susan Strange was that. Uh, she asked big questions, she had big ideas, and she recognized big trends. And Peter Trubowitz talked about one, which was seeing the exaggeration in the decline of the United States and also concomitantly the rise of Japan, but I would mention another. Susan Strange wrote Casino Capitalism 20 years before the great financial crisis and before we saw the casino played out in its full horror. Uh, she's a great voice in the field. My mentor, Robert Gilpin, who was not a man of many words, did always say, read Susan Strange to <laughs> graduate students who wanted to study the intersection of economics and politics. So, my lecture tonight is on the U.S.-China relationship, most important relationship in world politics today, and there are two recent events that I think nicely frame this discussion. The first was the 19th Party Congress, Chinese Communist Party, which just happened about a month ago, and that was widely regarded in the press as a coronation. Chinese leader Xi Jinping consolidated his power, made clear that he would be ruling for at least the next five, maybe even the next five or ten years after that. He joined the ranks of the great communist Chinese leaders, Mao and Deng Xiaoping. Xi Jinping thought is now enshrined in the Chinese constitution. I can only imagine that his counterpart, Donald Trump, looked upon all of this with some degree of envy. After all, a coronation <laughs> would be something he would delight in, but tragically for him, the American political system won't allow it. Now, these two leaders, there they are. <laughs> these two leaders have a lot in common. They both have autocratic tendencies. They both like to surround themselves with loyalists, they're both men of the people, and they both have a penchant for grand aspirational slogans. Trump's, of course, is make America great again. Xi Jinping is the China dream. I figured I'd swap them <laughs> here. I think they'd both be happy with that because essentially they're both nationalists who pine for an era when their country was great and want to see a future era when their country is great once again. Now, there are big differences, too. This guy on the left, he's a planner. 
He's got the Made in China 2025 Industrial Policy Plan. He's got the 2035 China as a Prosperous Society Plan. He's got the 2050 China Becomes the World's Great Power Plan. He's got it laid out for the next 35 years. This other leader, he's not a planner. <laughs> <laughs> he's a tweeter. Maybe he's a tweeter. Okay, tweeter. I'll take that. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's much more in the moment. He doesn't think about 2025 and 35 and 50. He thinks a lot more about who said what about him yesterday. Now, the eminent American statesman Henry Kissinger tutored Donald Trump in foreign policy for a few hours after the election, covering a whole range of topics. And Kissinger's off-the-record summary, very off-the-record, Chatham House rules here, off-the-record <laughs> summary to several reporters was simply, the new president does not have an orderly mind. <laughs> Fair point. I don't think you could argue with Kissinger on that. The second big event that's happened recently was the meeting of these two. The second meeting, meeting in Beijing. Now, of course, the American political establishment holds its collective breath every time Donald Trump goes abroad. But in this case, things worked really smoothly. These two leaders had a love fest. They exchanged gifts worth about $250 billion. And they took turns saying nice things about each other. Trump mustered all of his eloquence. He looked Xi Jinping right in the eye and he said, you are a very special man. <laughs> I don't know how you respond to that. Do you say, you too, or thank you, or my mom says that. I, I, don't, I don't know what he said. But I do know it went well. It went smoothly and everyone breathed a sigh of relief. Problem, of course, is that the relationship is not as smooth as the veneer of that particular meeting between these two leaders. The relationship, in fact, is in for some rough sledding. You can pick the word you like. Perilous, dangerous, uncertain. All these things characterize the U.S.-China relationship in the years ahead. And this is a relatively new thing. Because for 20 years after the end of the Cold War, 1990 to 2010, this relationship was characterized by a partnership. Right? I would say a grand bargain struck between the United States and China. But that bargain has collapsed, and the world we're moving into, as I say, a lot more uncertain and fraught with danger. So what I want to do tonight is really talk about three things, maybe four things. The first is talk about that 20-year partnership, what held it together, and why it ended. Secondly, look at the new world of US-China relations, which I think is an era of multi-dimensional competition. And finally, ask the big question that everybody worries about when great powers compete with each other, can that competition lead to war? All right, so let me start with what I would call the grand bargain. And here I simply mean the United States and China had a reciprocal relationship of mutual benefit that cut across two areas Susan Strange cared about, economics and power or security. And it served the interests of each in both of those realms. I think I want to start, let me start on the economic side. One of the things you notice most obviously about the US-China relationship is deep interdependence. These two countries are joined at the hip. Trade, finance, and investment. And this is rather extraordinary if you think historically. Right? The last time you had a great communist power and a great capitalist power interacting, they were economically isolated from each other, not integrated. So this is something very different. They also have a very particular division of labor in their economic relationship. China, under the last great leader, Deng Xiaoping, recognized early on that export-led growth was the strategy for China to make its way into prosperity. Deng recognized that China was both a communist state but also an Asian state. He followed in the path of the other Asian tigers, Japan, South Korea, even Taiwan, that used exports to grow their economies. He was a pragmatist, right? He believed in one of his famous phrases that it didn't matter if the cat was black or white as long as it caught the mouse. And Chinese cats caught lots of mice tremendously successful in exporting. 
especially to Western markets, especially to the United States, which developed an insatiable appetite for all things Chinese, all goods Chinese, especially consumer goods. Now, we know that as China exported more and the United States consumed more, that the merchandise trade balance widened significantly. You can see it here. You can see it really takes off at around 2000 when China joins the WTO. Mr. Trump worries a lot about this particular problem here. Just for context, the U.S. trade deficit with Japan back in the day when Japan was the great challenger in the world economy peaked out at about 150 billion annually. This one's at about twice that or more, 350. And the question for the United States, the practical question was, how do you finance this? How do you pay for this? The answer was simply by writing IOUs. Essentially, the bargain went like this. China exported to the United States. The United States, in exchange, gave China dollars. China took those dollars, reinvested them in treasury securities, or in effect, held them in its central bank. You can see this here, Chinese holdings of U.S. Treasuries. And again, it's the early 2000s that it really starts to take off. By around 2012, you know, China's holding something like $1.2 trillion, about the same as Japan, America's loyal Asian ally. And each of those are playing the prominent role in financing America's external deficits. This is a great benefit to the United States. Great benefit at least in the short and the medium run. Anytime someone lets you run a tab of $1.2 trillion, you should take that opportunity. And that's essentially what China did. And it meant that the United States, unlike ordinary countries that had to balance their accounts, could actually have it all. It could consume, it could invest in its economy, it could run a far-flung military empire with bases and soldiers all around the world, and it could do it all without having to overtax the American people. Remember, George W. Bush taught, fought two wars. Didn't raise taxes, actually cut taxes during that time. The United States enjoyed what the French in an earlier era called the exorbitant privilege of the reserve currency. Okay, now, see if we can go back here. There it is. A lot of people looking at this argued that the United States and China actually had complementary addictions. The, China's, the Chinese believed in, or were addicted to, exporting and lending, and the United States to consuming and borrowing. Others pointed out that this arrangement looked very much like the Cold War arrangement the United States had in economics with its closest military allies, West Germany and Japan. In each case, those were great exporting powers, and they, like good loyal soldiers, held American dollars. The French were not good soldiers and didn't hold American dollars, but the Germans and the Japanese did. That was, in effect, the Bretton Woods system, what China and the U.S. created after the end of the Cold War was Bretton Woods II. All right, that's the economic side. Let's talk about the security side. Now, it may seem a little bit strange to think about the United States and China as having a security partnership. I mean, after all, they're not allies, they're not military allies. They have very different political systems. They're not part of, you know, some kind of democratic community, right, some kind of security community. But nevertheless, I think very fair to argue that they developed a security partnership, one that served the interests of each side. Okay, now, let's see where we can go. There it is. Okay. There, now I can see it. <laughs> All right, so what did, it, what did it look like? Well, think of it this way it's 1990. Start on the Chinese side. 1990, you're the Chinese leadership. What are you most worried about? Not international issues, you're worried about domestic issues. The whole communist world's falling apart. You want to avoid the fate of Gorbachev. And you want to do it by not having to be too repressive. One Tiananmen Square is enough, thank you. So domestically, the goal is how do you maintain one party control? How do you stay in power as the world's changing all around you? 
What about internationally? What do the Chinese want? It's hard to say. We can make some, I think, reasonable inferences. We can infer that the Chinese leaders wanted to be respected as a great power. They wanted status. China has a long, distinguished history of being a great power, right? Centuries, not just decades. In the 1970s, when Henry Kissinger was in charge, he famously proclaimed that the United States was going to use the China card against the Soviet Union. And Chinese leaders quickly reminded Kissinger that they were not a card, they were a player. They were at the table, not on the table. Okay, so I think we can presume that that's something, as China became more powerful, it was going to want. But maybe it would want more than that. Maybe China would want the prerogatives, let's call them the neighborhood prerogatives of a great power. You know, great powers get to control their neighborhoods. The United States considers Central and South America its backyard. Even a weakened Russia controls what it calls the near abroad countries on its borders. Maybe China wanted that, and of course the United States was a resident power in China's backyard, controlling the backyard. We don't know, but what we do know is that China could have a range of aspirations in international relations. It's not even clear that the Chinese leaders at the time knew. But whatever their aspirations, one thing is clear. The absolute best strategy for China was rapid economic growth. That's the strategy that could solve the domestic problem. Because that would allow the Chinese government to maintain the social compact with the Chinese people, which is you have the opportunity to get rich, you have economic initiative and some economic freedoms, but we maintain centralized control politically. Gorbachev could not deliver that bargain. He couldn't deliver the economic side of it, and so he lost it all. Rapid economic growth would allow the Chinese to deliver it. And on top of that, rapid economic growth would give the Chinese the resources to be able to play in international affairs at whatever level of aspiration they ultimately developed. All the more so if they could develop and grow without necessarily alarming their smaller neighbors in East Asia peaceful rise. So for China, rapid economic growth was the optimal security strategy. Now bring the United States into this picture. Here is the world's only superpower. Did it throw obstacles in the way of China, which was looking to rise to great power status economically? No. It tolerated it. No, it did a lot more than tolerate it. It encouraged it. It nurtured it. It facilitated it. The United States did everything it could to help. You'll grow faster if you integrate into the world economy. Join the WTO, you'll grow even faster. Well, what about access to raw materials and to energy? Don't worry, the American Navy patrols the sea lanes. We'll make the world safe for commerce, your commerce as well as our commerce. For, the, for China, this is a very nice world to be able to live in. What about for the United States? Didn't, didn't the Americans see what could happen here? Didn't they see where they might be in 2017? Didn't they read John Mearsheimer? Come on, they should have, should have read Mearsheimer. Well, think of it this way. The Americans did get a lot of economic benefits out of this relationship. But come on, would the United States really mortgage its security for a bunch of cell phones? I mean, the iPhone 10 with edge-to-edge -edge display, maybe. <laughs> no, not at all. The United States didn't think of it that way. The United States actually thought that this relationship brought security benefits to America as well. And to understand that, you have to understand something about liberal internationalist thinking which is prominent in the United States across political parties. Right? The argument I'm about to make is an argument that Ronald Reagan's comfortable with, and George H.W. Bush was comfortable with, and Bill Clinton was comfortable with, and George W. Bush was comfortable with, and so is Barack Obama 
probably until about 2010 or 2011. And it's an argument that can be summarized as all good things go together. And it runs something like this. The more China becomes integrated into the world economy, the more China will develop a consumerist mentality, and the more it will see a stake in the existing international order, America's international order. It won't want to upset the apple cart, undermine the order. This is the same logic that Kissinger put forward in detente in the 1970s, when he wanted to weave the Soviet Union into a web of interdependence. And at the time, some people commented that the idea was that a fat bear would be a happy bear. Same logic applies whether it's a Soviet grizzly or a Chinese panda. Fat bear is a happy bear. The United States with China took it even a step further. As China developed, they bet that China would become not just content, but an active supporter of the American-centered world system. They had a phrase for it. Responsible stakeholder, Bob Zellick, Deputy Secretary of State, gave a speech in 2005 where he basically said, look China, look at all the economic benefits you're getting. It's time for you to step up and actually give something back. And what you need to give back really has a lot to do with our agenda. You need to be tougher on rogue states like Iran and Sudan and North Korea. You need to be much better at non-proliferation. You need to play a role in managing the world economy, so on and so forth. Essentially, the United States wanted China to be a modern-day version of post-war Japan and Germany, a civilian economic great power that supported the American-centered order. Now, it was a bet. And the United States was willing to make that bet, in large part, because it was so far ahead, militarily, of the Chinese. So, I took this picture, Chongqing Zoo, it's not bad, a few years back. It captured to me this whole responsible stakeholder idea. There's a panda bear placidly munching on bamboo. You know, eat a lot of bamboo and you're not going to want to go swimming in the South China Sea or anywhere like that. You, know, you have to digest, you don't have to do that. But then there's more bamboo and eventually, so you get the idea. That was kind of, kind of the theme for the United States. So, both China and the United States saw the potential for security benefits in this partnership, in this grand bargain. Now, it didn't hold up. We know that. We look back at 2017 and the world looks a lot different than it did in the mid-90s or even in the mid-2000s. What happened? I'm going to develop two arguments. There's a lot of different ways you could explain this. One has to do with power and one has to do with economics. Well, the security side of power and the economic side of power is probably a better way to say it. Right? The first is that old thing in international relations, changes in relative power and the law of uneven growth, the law of really uneven growth in this case. Look, everybody expected China to grow, but that rapidly for that long? 30 years of 9% annual growth? No big, no country's ever done that, much less a big country. Just incredible. And the magic of compounding, I think, wasn't even all that apparent until it became apparent. But think about this, in 2004, China's GDP was one-eighth of that of the United States. Right? Ten trillion versus about a trillion and a quarter. About ten years later, in 2015, it was two-thirds. Eighteen trillion versus twelve trillion. Right? You can see it on this chart. By 2014, right, the green line is purchasing power parity. China actually crossed the United States in PPP terms. People who make linear projections, I don't, we can talk about that later, actually say by 2030 you assume 6% growth for China, which is slower growth than it's been, and 2% growth for the United States, the green line and the red line would cross. So China grew rapidly, far more rapidly than anyone expected. China also, as it grew rapidly, devoted a lot more resources to its military. 
Right? And here again, you can see it's around the middle of the 2000s where it really starts to take off. Between 1990 and 2015, America's defense budgets grew by about 100%. China's grew from a much smaller base by about 2,000%. And as China began to develop that military capability, it also began to assert itself more in its neighborhood, in its region. All right? Here's a picture, one way to think about it, the famous nine dashed line of China. It's the red line on the outside. Lots of countries make claims in the South and East China Sea, and China's basically claimed the whole thing. We know it's become more assertive in pushing those claims. And at the same time, finally, it's become not more liberal, but less liberal. China's become more authoritarian over time, not less. It continues to redouble that social compact with the Chinese people. And in the era of Xi Jinping, as Chinese has started to encounter some of the unintended consequences of rapid growth, like great inequalities in income and wealth, and corruption, and rising expectations for the middle class, it has centralized control all the more so. So for the United States, by about 2010, this picture was doubly disappointing. China is growing militarily and asserting itself in its region, a region where the United States considers its role vital. At the same time, it's becoming more rather than less authoritarian. The United States, in turn, undertakes Obama's infamous pivot to East Asia after 10 years of, let's be frank, making a mess in the Middle East. The United States decides that, in, on one hand, it needs to respond to the requests of allies that are pulling America back in. On the other, it has to assert itself and make sure China understands that it will remain a resident power in the region. China, for its part, sees this, and understandably so, as a strategy of containment of the United States trying to encircle and contain Japan, uh, China rather than allowing it to continue to grow and take on a greater role in the region. China starts to question whether it really could count on the United States to defend its sea lanes, and you get the action-reaction spiral in the region that we have today. Okay, so that's, that's one part of the story. Other part of the story is the financial crisis. Financial crisis really undermined the economic side of the U.S.-China bargain. Think about it in material terms and in psychological terms. Materially, the financial crisis meant that the era of export-led growth for China was over. The world economy was not going to grow fast enough to accommodate that. And given China's great success in exporting, countries weakened by the financial crisis, think America and the countries of Western Europe, were no longer going to be as hospitable to Chinese exports. China needed a new strategy, enters an era of uncertainty where it starts to move towards a domestic consumption strategy and find other ways to sustain growth, and we know that Chinese growth rates have been declining. The United States, too, really should have gotten a wake-up call at the financial crisis. It should have really recovered from its addiction, consuming and borrowing. It did for a short amount of time. Borrowing, though, in aggregate terms, is back up. It's a slower learner than I think the Chinese are. Psychologically, though, the financial crisis, I think, had an even bigger impact. Because one of the underlying premises of Chinese participation in an American-centered world economy was that the United States knew how to run it. <coughs> and the financial question crisis called that into question. The United States almost tanked the world economy. The American model is no longer a model that people want to emulate. There's no longer a Washington consensus. So for China, the financial crisis meant the United States might not be able to provide the kind of leadership to create a world economy, a stable world economy. China itself is not ready to take on that responsibility. So it's in this awkward position of neither leader nor a follower. And that's kind of where we find ourselves today. So where do we go from here? If the great bargain has now collapsed, 
I think we enter a new era of multidimensional competition. Now, neither the United States nor China are happy with the relationship. Ni neither got their ideal outcome. The United States wanted a supporter. Modern-day Japan or Germany didn't get that. The Chinese wanted, in Xi's words, a new type of great power relations. And by that, I think he pretty clearly meant what China wanted was a cooperative relationship with the United States where it would be treated as an equal and where the United States would defer to China, particularly in China's neighborhood. The United States hasn't been willing to, so China hasn't gotten that either. What they've gotten instead is kind of an old type of great power relations. One that's a competition for influence. Now, there are many dimensions to it. I just want to give you a snapshot of four of the current dimensions of this competition. First, there's a regional military competition. I stress regional here. The reason I stress regional is because China is not a peer competitor of the United States militarily in global terms. For all that China's done, the United States still outspends China by three or four times in defense, $700 billion a year versus about 200. The United States alone can project power all over the world, has alliances, bases, it's technologically more advanced. But there is a regional competition. There's a military competition in East Asia. And the strategy for China is very simple, I think very clear. It's essentially to complicate the ability of the United States to act with its own wide discretion in the region. China, in effect, wants to make sure that the United States today and in the future in East Asia can't do what it did in the Persian Gulf in 1990, which is basically operate militarily in a theater without any serious constraint, either from the target country or from other great powers, who in 1990 either supported the United States or watched. Anti-access and area denial, those strategies for China are essentially designed to neutralize those American advantages. And I think to some success, significant success. I read the Pentagon for that. Pentagon, which for years talked about how to maintain American primacy, put out a report in June called How to Prepare for a Post-Primacy World. A world in which the United States can no longer assume that it will have unchallenged military superiority across key theaters. South and East China, Xi, East China Sea is, I think, what the Pentagon's talking about there. Okay? So that's one aspect of this competition. Another is a regional rulemaking competition going on. Hegemonic states, dominant states, they make the rules of international relations. It's no surprise that in the post-war world, the kind of norms of the system, individual and human rights, freer trade, non-proliferation, self-determination, all those things reflect the interests and values of the United States and its Western coalition. China is not challenging the United States to replace those rules with its own rules. But China is trying to establish that the United States should not enjoy a monopoly on rulemaking. And you see this play out, I think, very clearly, both in security and economics. In the South China Sea, all that can be boiled down, in my view, to a struggle over rulemaking and governance. The United States proclaims freedom of navigation, which is a way of saying, we get to operate wherever we want, whenever we want, however we want. China's saying, not so fast, we claim a lot of this territory and the airspace and water around it. We're building new islands and we're going to claim the area around those new islands. In other words, we're creating facts in the water that establishes our ability to decide who can go where and when. You see the same thing on the economic side. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, was, in my view, a very savvy American attempt at rulemaking. Essentially, what the Obama administration said was, we're going to create the new regional rules for the world economy. They're going to be our rules. They're going to be things like intellectual property protection and more market and less state. 
In China, you're not part of this, but you can be, but only if you adjust to our rules. Put China in a tough situation. Well, happily for China, the United States shot itself in the foot multiple times on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that's at best in abeyance if it's not completely dead. But China, too, has moved in a rulemaking, a regional rulemaking direction in many different ways, but I think the most important is the Belt and Road Initiative. Essentially, what China's doing is saying, we have tons of money. We're going to use that money to create an architecture, an infrastructure across Eurasia. And from that architecture and infrastructure will come influence. The Belt and Road Initiative has been compared to the Marshall Plan. I think that's actually a pretty good comparison. It may not be as successful, it's on a much wider scale, but just as the United States found that money infrastructure led to influence, China, I would argue, is hoping to do the same. There's a soft power competition, the power of values. Here, too, China's goal is not to replace Western values with Chinese values, but to neutralize the universality of Western values. Right? The West has great advantages in soft power. Democracy, free press, individualism, all these rights. Right? That's very attractive to populations, especially in authoritarian states. It's a real vulnerability for author authoritarian governments. The Chinese strategy is very simple. There's no universal values. Many ways to think about human rights, many ways to think about how states and markets interact. In this competition, the Chinese have a tremendous ally in the White House. They have Donald Trump on their side. Because Donald Trump never talks about liberal international values. He never extols the virtues of democracy. He praises dictators. He talks about moral equivalence. China couldn't be happier. They've had the opportunity to present themselves in, ver in very different contexts as the protectors of America's values. Davos man, right? Xi Jinping goes to Davos and basically argues, we are the, now the new protector of the liberal international economic order. Please, you know, you get an Academy Award for acting there. But Trump gave him the opportunity. Finally, and this in some ways to me is the most troubling, you've got dueling economic nationalism. For different reasons, the two most important players in the world economy are moving in a nationalist direction. The United States is no longer the guarantor of the free trade system or the liberal world economy. China, though, is also moving in a much more nationalist direction. China still talks about economic reform, but it means something very different. It doesn't mean less state, more market. It means strengthening and protecting the state sector. That 2025 plan I talked about earlier, that plan is an industrial policy plan to catapult China to the commanding technological heights. Right? Whether in biotechnology or artificial intelligence or medical equipment, or electric cars, whatever, whatever the 10 big areas are, China wants to be a leader in them. And it's doing it through the state, through state subsidies, right, through technology transfer. This is a version of China Incorporated, China Inc. Now, there's some troubling implications here. One is that the last time there was an Inc., it was Japan Inc., Japan and the United States competing in the same way. America gets very uncomfortable when someone wants to compete at the technological frontier. Led to great conflicts between the United States and Japan, and they were allies. So the potential for economic conflict between America and China has greatly intensified. Okay. And that's important because for a lot of people, even as security competition between the United States and China has intensified, you could always count on economic interdependence to act as kind of an emergency break to hold back that security competition. The emergency break, I would argue, is slipping. And a dangerous situation would be one in which the United States and China were competing and had conflicts economically as well as in security. All right, that's kind of a dark picture of the new environment. Last question, before we open up to questions, is this one. Can competition lead to military conflict? The big existential question. 
Here I think there's good news and bad news. The good news is that power transition war is pretty unlikely. I think this is a 25 year out problem, not a today or a five to 10 year out problem. International relations scholars worry a lot about power transitions. Rising powers, you know, they want to establish the rules. Those already on top want to preserve their dominant position. But the two kinds of wars that would come out of power transition don't seem to me plausible. One is the Thucydides War, Peloponnesian War created by the rise of Athenian power and the fear it caused in Sparta. The basic argument is that Athens was getting too powerful too fast. Sparta had to fight now instead of fighting later, a preventive war. I don't see that in the US-Chinese context. China and the United States are regional competitors. They're not global competitors. The costs of war today are horrific. It's hard to see a rational strategy for the United States as the dominant power. Same, I think, is true of the second way, which is the 1930s argument, the Germany-Japan dissatisfied power. Powers that look at the international system and say, we're a rising power, but the system's rigged against us. We can't maintain our economic prosperity. We have no status and prestige. Not the case for China. China may not be all that satisfied in East Asia, but it's not a dissatisfied global power. So I don't think we have to worry very much, maybe we will in the future, about power transition. I do think there's two things we do have to worry about. One is inadvertent conflict, the stumble into war. Nobody intends it, nobody wants it, but you end up there. And the problem is that East Asia seems to me to have all the ingredients for the stumble into an inadvertent conflict. It's got flashpoints, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, Taiwan Straits could become a flashpoint again, the India-China border. Any one of those could light that little spark. And then you've got a lot of nationalism around to fan the flames. Just think of the Chinese-Japanese relationship, where both of them have declared they have a core vital interest in Senkaku Dayu, a bunch of rocks that nobody inhabits. And they flame their public opinions into this is really high stakes for us. And then there's one other little ingredient that I think is unrecognized but really important. The uncertainty of where states have drawn their red lines. Where are everyone's vital interests? Everyone's probing around in this region. The clearer vital interests are, the less likely you're going to run the risk of inadvertent escalation. Let me just give you an example of where I think red lines and vital interests have been blurred. For the last six years, the Obama administration, whenever it met with Chinese leaders, South China Sea, South China Sea, South China Sea, this is what we care about. We don't like what you're doing in the South China Sea. The American military still believes that. President Trump never talks about it. When Xi Jinping met with Trump in Mar-a-Lago, they didn't talk about the South China Sea. The recent summit, they talked about North Korea, they talked about trade frictions, Nothing about the South China Sea. Back burner issue. Now the Chinese might, and I think it would be a mistake, at some point think, you know, the Americans really care about the North Korean thing, less so about South China Sea. Maybe we can probe a little bit more there. That's the kind of situation you worry about. And I think those are the kind of conditions that are ripe in East Asia today. That, I think, is the five to 10 year. This problem, the challenge of crisis management, the last point, that's the one year. That's the now problem. <laughs> you got this guy, right? The North Korean problem is a double problem. On the one hand, it's a US-North Korea problem. And the problem there is that both sides are working as hard as they can to violate the most important rule of crisis management. Allow your adversary a face-saving way to back down. Neither of the two leaders involved in this are doing that. They're doing the opposite, provoking each other, escalating the rhetoric, rocket man's on a suicide mission, you're a senile old dotard. Why are you telling me I'm old? I'm not telling you that you're short and fat. Ha ha, I just told you you were short and fat. Right? <laughs> I mean, 
This kind of, who sees this in diplomacy? <laughs> and compared to the Cuban Missile Crisis, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev wrote to Kennedy at one point, we're both pulling on the rope of war. If we continue to pull on it, the knot will get so tight that we won't be able to untangle it. These two leaders are pulling on the rope. Secondly, it's a US-China problem. And the problem here is both the United States and China would love to be able to resolve this problem, but they have very different core interests. The United States sees North Korea's missiles and nuclear weapons as an existential threat. It wants to be rid of them and rid of the regime as well. For China, the regime and the weapons are not an existential threat. Instability is an existential threat. The collapse of North Korea is. It means people flooding into China. It means the possibility of a unified Korea that's an ally with the West. The problem is the United States needs China's help, but there are limits to what China can do because it doesn't want to trigger that instability. There may be a way to slide through this one, but there are lots of bad outcomes here. I mean, just think of these three. One, China helps too little. America gets upset and decides to ratchet up the economic pressure on China to get China to do more, and you have a US-China economic conflict. China does too much, and it actually triggers. It's too helpful. It actually triggers a North Korean economic collapse with everything attendant to that. Or the worst outcome, the rashest, would be the United States taking matters into its own hand and dangerously thinking there's a military solution to this problem which could lead to chaos in the region and draw the United States and China in. So you've got three kinds of problems. You've got a 25-year, a 10-year, and a right-now problem. All of them are challenging. So my conclusion is that the road ahead is also a challenging one. All right. Thank you, Mark. That's it. That, that was, we're on, Kevin? Yeah, we're on. Um, that was terrific. Uh, I'm mindful of time here. I think, uh, Manoush, I'm going to give you a, a question, give you an opportunity to ask a question, and then we're going to open it up. OK, very good. Uh, wonderful kind of tour of the whole world, basically, but the most important bits. My question is, you kind of hypothesized that the responsible stakeholder model for Chinese integration <coughs> failed. And we're now moving to this kind of multipolar competition where China arguably will be a regional hegemon. But let me push you a little bit to argue that maybe they're actually building their own new rules of the game. Under one scenario, the One Belt, One Road initiative stretches to Europe. It more or less encompasses the whole world except the Americas under some versions of the One Belt, One Road. They've also proceeded with creating their own multilateral institutions, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, the BRICS financing facility, which looks a bit like an IMF type thing. So they've kind of got the rudiments of their own Bretton Woods system under construction. So are they really ultimately going to build their own, do they aspire to building their own international rules of the game? Well, they might. I mean, it's, it's hard to say uh, at this point because I think it would re require a much greater leap in power than what the Chinese have now. Remember, the United States was a great power by the 1930s but did not see itself taking on a rules of the game mode right until after the Second World War. Yeah. So I think there's some question of it. But I think it's Im you, you made a lot of important points about how the gravity of world affairs has shifted to Asia. I mean, think about it. Six billion people versus one billion people in the Eastern Hemisphere versus the Western Hemisphere. For the Chinese to develop a Belt and Road Initiative, that succeeded, and that's, that's a question. I mean, you could worry about the one billion later, worry about the six billion now. So yes, in effect, given so much of the locus of the world economy is moving towards Asia. Mm. I think it is possible to see that a regional strategy for China could very easily devolve into a global, a global strategy. I'm going to open it up. Um, so uh, raise your hands, and I'll, um, when, when I, we call on you, I'm going to group questions. Um, 
just briefly introduce yourself and try to make the questions succinct. I think you had your hand up first, so we'll start down here, and then uh, let's start there. Uh, thanks. Um, Arnab Das from Invesco. Um, I wonder, the, the, the countries in China's near abroad are not intrinsic allies of China, right? right? They're actually, in one way or another, they're all enemies. Yes. So is that strategy viable, number one? Number two, <coughs> sometimes it seems like the One Belt, One Road um, initiative has um, more hot air than substance um, outside of the money being spent in Pakistan, which may be good money after bad. So I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Hold that you thought for a second. Okay. Um, this woman right over here. <coughs> Um, I have a question about China's soft power strategy. It seems like um, a political theorist, Wang Huning, a former uh, university political science teacher, uh, a professor, and now he entered the, uh, the top Politburo. He uh, occupied a seat from this uh, sort of the top power. And I'm wondering, um, what do you expect of China's next move of its uh, forming its soft power um, as you can see, there's a political uh, theorist was entering the top mm -hmm. uh, level of this Communist Party. And um, also, uh, do you think the world will really buy China's soft power? Thank you. Take one more. Yeah, I'll take one more. One more. Guy in the green shirt in the back. I think it's green. You're back up there. Yes, just keep your hand up. There you go. <coughs> Um, Najam Abbas from the East West Institute. Professor Masanduno, you refer to a new era of multi dimensional competition. Could the other side of that coin be a multi dimensional constraints realm? Uh, I wish to draw to the situation in North Korea. Uh, how come? it was allowed by US administration and Chinese government to snowball in both size and gravity uh, to the extreme cost which has been rising. So why do you consider that there has been a method behind the madness which has gone out of proportion? Okay. There you go. Okay, great, great questions. Let me, I'll start in the middle with the soft power question, what, what is China really trying to do here? I mean, my sense, and the Chinese have been very clear, there may not be a Washington consensus, but please don't talk about a Beijing consensus either. In other words, we don't want to be so out in front with that. There may come a time when the Chinese have sufficient authority to put their own kind of values imprint on the international system, I don't, I don't see now as that time. I, I think actually China is in this area more fragile than people allow. I mean, you've got an incredibly dynamic society that's just experienced incredible rapid economic growth. I think the existential domestic problem of holding it all together <laughs> is still the key. And I think for China, what that means is let's make sure that we're not swept up in some kind of democratic individual rights revolution. So let's try and play this game in a way to kind of moderate or just neutralize the kind of soft power competition. I don't see them saying we need to get the upper hand and, and, and take advantage here. I, I, don't, I don't quite see that. I mean, on, on Belt and Road and, and the region, you're absolutely right. China does not have many allies in the region. That's one of the great advantages of the United States, a country that never wanted allies, right, developed over the post-war era. I think China's stepping a little bit more gingerly, right? We can buy some influence with Belt and Road. You're also right. It's not clear. It's a lot of hot air, right? It's a lot of money potentially thrown at it, but there are lots of parts of it that actually could be very problematic. You know, this thing is supposed to go through parts of the world that are, to say the least, sort of dangerously unstable. 
It's not clear to me that that's ever going to happen. But I think what's really important is that the Chinese, right, and Director Shafiq's point about this too, have put out feelers in all kinds of different ways to create trial balloons of global governance. Again, I think more as a way to neutralize Western advantages. Again, the position is more fragile than it looks. And just look at the Chinese reaction to the newest language of the Trump administration, which is ref to refer to the Asia Pacific as the Indo Pacific. Right? And the Chinese are like, please stop doing that. Right? You're really not going to tell us that you're going to have an alliance with India. We see what's going on here. Right? So the Chinese position, again, more, more fragile. Third question was about North Korea and why did the United States and China kind of let it get out of control? I'm not sure they had a lot of choice in letting it get out of control. I, my own view is that the United States has completely misframed the problem. Right? North Korea is hell-bent for its own reasons on having a nuclear weapons capability. The United States view is North Korea is a problem to be solved, not a state to be deterred. You know, deterrence worked in the past. Why is it that North Korea can't have them, but China in 1966 could? Was Mao's China any less of a potential undermining force in the eyes of the United States and North Korea? Don't think so. Learn to live with that. You can learn to live with this. Um, right down here. All the way down, gentlemen. I think you're Giles. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Giles Merritt, and I'm sure my mother would have enjoyed your lecture every bit as much as I did. I'd like to tempt you to talk a little about demographics, which are, after all, perhaps the least unreliable forecasting tool we have. And the demographics tell us that China is already starting to age quite quickly. America, on the other hand, has a very positive demographic outlook, going from a bit over 300 million to 400 million young people, unlike in Europe. And then you have Africa, population doubling, same in the Arab world, and you haven't mentioned India at all. So could you, could you talk a bit about demographics? Yes. That's a, a student of structural advantages. I see that. Demographic <laughs> advantages. Let me get another couple questions. Gentlemen back there, um, halfway up. Dr. Mastanduno, um, <coughs> Daniel Yoon, postgraduate student. Um, we, we met. Yes. Um, <laughs> you seem to pinpoint uh, the 2010 pivot as the origin of um, China's paranoia, if you will, of, of containment and encirclement. Did it really come that late? Was there not, was pre-2010 China, would pre-2010 China agree with you that the United States was a benevolent provider and encourager of its growth? And if it did not, what would you say the source of this paranoia toward the United States be? Uh, right there, woman right over there. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I'm Rachel Liu, a student from SAIS. Thank you so much for your talk. And uh, I mean, you talk a lot about China's role in the international stage, and people are talking about China being a threat, as a, we say ambition, being a regional hegemony. But I was more curious about the domestic politics of China. So as we all know, China is facing like a increasing domestic problematic recently. And I was wondering how this domestic problematic will undermine the China's ambition to enter the global stage. I mean, how China is going to balance the domestic politics and international like politics. Thank you so much. Great, great questions, yes. I mentioned that Susan Strange believed in big trends and <laughs> demography is clearly a big trend here. This is, I mentioned at one point in the talk, I don't believe in linear yeah. projections, and, and in part it was because of this. It's because China, China faces quite a predicament, and sometimes phrased this way, which is, you know, will China get old before it gets truly rich, uh, in, in per capita terms? It's a very serious 
problem for China because the working population is tailing right at about the time, right, that growth is, is slowing, right? And you're going to see it probably it's around 2025 that you're going to see that. The United States here traditionally has had tremendous advantages being a country with open immigration. <laughs> right? Recognize the strategic advantage, America, of open immigration. The United States has reimagined itself over and over again that way. Mm -hmm. when, when did it kick in? You know, was China paranoid? I mean, I actually don't think China's paranoid post-2010. I don't think it's paranoid at all for a rising power to feel that some other power wants to hem it in. I think the real turning point was the financial crisis. Because for China, the issue was, even if there's going to be security frictions, so long as we can be confident that we're going to have a stable world and predictable world economy that we can interact in, then I think things are going to work out OK. I think the financial crisis both first shook China's confidence, but then actually increased China's confidence. Remember, it happened around the time of the Beijing Olympics. And there was a lot of talk about the Chinese model. They figured it out. You know, this kind of authoritarian capitalism thing, this actually, this actually works. Putin was much stronger at the time, too. So I don't, I don't see it as much as paranoia. I see it as a healthy skepticism of the United States. We're willing to give them the benefit of the doubt earlier, after 2010, less so. I apologize, I missed the third. third one was on the domestic politics domestic. Yes. in China. Yes, so a great question about the link between domestic and international politics. I mean, my instinct with China is always to look domestically first. And here's one way I think about how that link has played out. What constitutes legitimacy for the one-party system in China? It's not ideology. Maybe it was in the era of Mao. For a long time, it was the ability to deliver the goods. Right? It was economic performance. But what happens as growth starts to slow? Well, you've got a very fractious society, and as growth slows, you need some other source of legitimacy. And that source of legitimacy, to me, is nationalism. And I see a lot of China's operations in its region as, in part, a way to create a lot more nationalist sentiment in China, not to completely replace economics as a legitimizing force, but as a way to provide a little bit of a hedge for the Communist Party if growth really starts to slow down. So I think there is a direct link between domestic and international, and I think it plays out in the region. I actually don't think China is at the point where it feels we're ready to be a regional hegemon. But I think it's important for China, especially in an age where the public is watching carefully, to be able to show, and this is much more with Japan than with America, to be able to show that it's defending the national interest. James, uh, up here in the on third row. Cheers. Uh, James Morrison in IR here. Uh, on the possibility of conflict, Mike, you emphasize that there's both good news and bad news. And so I wanted to get your take, particularly with all of our students here, because I've been telling them there's really only bad news. Um, so you were sanguine about or the prospects of a power transition war and instead emphasized the inadvertent, inadvertent escalation and crisis management problems. My concern is that the lesson of history of 1914 is that these things often combine together and that there's a real analogy here in which they could combine together again. So in 1914, prior to 1914, you have the Thucydian trap. Germany is growing very rapidly, very ambitious, very dissatisfied with not getting their share. And Britain is, frankly, hubristic and, uh, and doesn't take uh, these things seriously, perhaps until too late. And then, of course, there's the crisis of July, the July crisis, Franz Ferdinand shot escalation, and these deep existential frustrations on the part of Germany and Britain combined together to give us the First World War. So why is this not analogous to China and the U.S. today? We have time for, uh, how about the gentleman back in the, on the white shirt and the 
gray vest. Um, hello, I'm uh, William from the Edward James School of Political Studies. Um, you've talked a lot today about the idea that um, China is the one that's, that's developing and perhaps America under Trump um, has the potential to fall back. Um, but from what I can see from history, the US's decline has been <laughs> written about many a time before. And we had the excellent question about demographics as well before. So is there a potential scenario where instead of China being the rising power and America being the declining one, what we're really seeing is another American century and China turns out not to live up to its potential? That's good. Let's take the gentleman right there in the middle. Yeah. Michael Allen, Professor of Political Science at Bryn Mawr College and protege of Susan of the 1980s. Um, wh how, what would you say to the idea that, that the, the competition between China and the United States is about two ways of reproducing the world economy? And, and that this, the, the, the potential uh, influence in, in parts of the global south, particularly in Africa, is about giving options that they used to have in the 1970s, which they no lo did not have under the Washington consensus. So that China is offering another way of modernizing other than by the American way. And, um, and then the second question has to do with, uh, again, with the domestic context. What do you think of the, the incoherence between a capitalist export economy and a Marxist ideology on paper? To what extent? Will that contradiction come home to bite them at some point? OK, again, so sort of big, big questions. Let me start with uh, James's question. You know, I'm trying to not be totally pessimistic. And, and <laughs> you have to say, no, it's linked. Even the one you think is good news, that's also bad news. But I do, I, I think, yes, I mean, that, that scenario, there's a trap there. And I could see an inadvertent war scenario there. But I think there's a big difference between the US, China today, and Britain and Germany in the early, to, in the early 20th century. I mean, they were peer competitors. I mean, they, literally, I mean, China and the United States are not, they're not, they could stumble into some kind of war, but it's very hard for me to see, you know, the kind of soldiers mobilizing and marching in the same kind of way, especially in a nuclear era. So I have, I think, more confidence that this kind of thing could be controlled. Doesn't mean they couldn't fight a war, but the idea that a war would turn into the kind of conflagration that we had in the World Wars, I just have a harder time seeing that. But I respect what you're telling your students. Keep them pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps them on their toes. That's a good thing. All right, now, from the American perspective, the more optimistic thing, maybe this is, once again, America's decline being exaggerated. Entirely possible. Every time we count the United States out, it seems to find a way to come back. Now, I think there is a scenario here, and it has to do with the difficulties of technological innovation. Right? Both Bob Gilpin and Susan Strange talked about technological innovations and how important they were, and how they tend to cluster in time and space, and how you have to have the right conditions for them. I'm not sure it can be orchestrated from the top. And that's really the Chinese strategy, just as it was the Japanese strategy. Japan was great when it was copying, copying, copying. Got to the technological frontier and said, what do we do now? This is harder to do with METI and Japan Incorporated. So I think there is a scenario there. But as always, the question for the United States is, it might have the cards, is it going to play the hand? Right? And, and where we are right now, it's very easy for people to feel the United States isn't going to play the hand, but it's a long game. So what you're saying is entirely possible. The last question on the contradiction between sort of a Marxist ideology and a capitalist economy. Yes, it's the great contradiction. Contradiction between one party centralized political rule and economic freedom. That's the tightrope China's been walking incredibly well for 25 years. It's amazing how well you could walk that tightrope when your economy grows really rapidly. The question ahead is, can you walk it when you're not growing as fast? So will it come home to roost? I think eventually. 
That's why I don't believe in linear projections. Question over here. Uh, thank you, Professor. I'm the student from UCL School of Slavonic and Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm very impressed by your uh, contrast of the uh, relationship between the cap communism and uh, capitalism between uh, Soviet Union and USA uh, in the Cold War period and now uh, between China and, U uh, and US. What do you think, uh, what's the difference make that? Um, is it really because uh, the Cold War is the inevitable aftermath of the Co World War II, or is it because now the Chinese uh, economic uh, influence in the world or its political influence in the world? And the second question is, a uh, is about the uh, Chinese, uh, the one belt, one road uh, strategy, because I heard some comment about it, said it's actually a kind of new uh, Michelle plan in the new era, and but the reaction from China said uh, it's absolutely not. So, uh, what's your what's your comment on that? And thank you. And question over here. Um, we're talking about um, international political economy. We've talked a lot about politics, and I think a bit less about economics, um, but you pointed out that it was the financial crisis which actually destabilized um, part of the American hegemony. Um, is it not the case that China, which has been practicing the same kind of um, debt-based uh, uh, economic growth, is also not vulnerable and possibly vulnerable relatively soon? And if that happens, what will be the consequence? Gentlemen, straight in the center there, about 10 rows in, right there. Just hold your hand up. He's got a black scarf. Thank you. Um, well, my question uh, relates to the two red lines that you mentioned about the future of the Chinese and American relationship regarding inadvertent, escala uh, inadvertent escalation or the challenge of crisis management. So yesterday, actually, the US Congress has been urged to require Chinese media to comply with the FARA provisions. Um, and so I was wondering if the lack of governance within the United States is not going to contribute to make these two threats that you mentioned even worse, uh, thus actually making the prospects of a conflict between the two countries even uh, more likely. Go ahead, Mark. I think that's probably it. Okay. The so again, uh, groups of three. But yeah. I do <laughs> groups of three. All good. All good. <laughs> so the. The cold, the cold War question, I think, is a very interesting one. I mean, it's a much larger question as sort of how, how it developed and why it developed differently. But I would just say, as a summary point, the big difference is that the Soviet Union actually mobilized itself and raised itself to great power status internally, outside of whatever the existing system was, right? Stalin's revolution from above, forced collectivization, mass industrialization, whereas for China, it integrated within the existing order, within the system, integrated itself in the world economy. Very different strategy from either the Soviet Union or another dark example, Nazi Germany, right? Which was basically, we're gonna do it by extending territorial control. Japanese did the same thing. China's a very different <coughs> kind of animal. And, and I think, it's a bear, right? And, and the difference is, important in thinking about whether you could actually have another Cold War. I don't think you can have a Cold War of the Soviet US variety. China is so integrated economically that you can't see the world dividing and picking sides. It's too costly. That's why Southeast Asian states are hedging all over the place. We want America's security insurance policy. We want to be able to trade with China and with America. The cost would be really great of disrupting this. How could the United States get the Europeans on board for a new Cold War? It was hard enough with the Soviet Union when they had minimal economic ties. Think about the integration of the world economy today. 
So I do think you're looking at a very different kind of structure if, in fact, you get you know, what IR people like to call a bipolar structure down the road. Just would, it would have different char characteristics. That was such a good question. I'm trying to remember what the other two were. Um, <laughs> Uh, the vulnerability on the debt, Chinese debt vulnerability. Yes, and then the island chains. Yeah, so there, I mean, there are there there is a lot of Chinese vulnerability, and I think, look, the vulnerability for China is really the same question the United States is facing, and lots of countries are facing: is how do you sustain growth? What is the new growth strategy? You know, you can't say we're going to go from an export-led strategy to a domestic consumption strategy by flipping a switch, especially if consumers want information technology, and that goes to the heart of what you're trying to control politically. China's already done incredible things. It's moved from 35, exports is 35% of GDP to about 25%. So domestic consumption's increasing. It's not clear, though, how far they could play that out. It's not clear that an industrial policy strategy should work. So I think you're right. I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the road ahead for China, just as, frankly, there is economically for the United States. Is the United States governance today creating more risks? Well, I would have to say, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, you've got this strange government where you have a bunch of people from the foreign policy establishment, people like Mattis, who are basically saying, you know, Matt, was it Mattis and Kelly? Are they the ones who have the deal? Only one of us always has to be in Washington. We can't both be out of the city at the same time because somebody's got to control this guy, right? Look, you have a lot of uncertainty. You have, the bandwidth of uncertainty is much larger today in American foreign policy than it's, it's been before. So yeah, I think all those risks are magnified. They would be there anyway. They are magnified today. You're absolutely right. So on that hopeful note, um, <laughs> so we've reached uh, 8 o'clock. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you for just a terrific... <laughs>